The UN Global Compact on Migration is about how the member states of the United Nations, in particular the member states of the advanced, rich North or West, that is Europe and North America, is going to accommodate and deal with the problem that has arisen in, over the last little while uh, of this mass unfettered migration from the global south to the global north. And the document lays out all the various means and methods by which countries like Canada have to come forward and accommodate this problem that has arisen. But what is left unstated and is never clarified and never mentioned is why and how this problem arose in the first place. To understand that, we have to go back into Agenda 2030, of which the UN Global Compact is part and parcel of this larger picture. And then critique Agenda 2030 to understand why this problem has arisen and in what ways a problem that might be directly attributed to the United Nation itself, a problem brought about by the United Nation in so many different ways as we look into Agenda 2030, is now being made to be dealt with by countries like Canada, which was, in a sense, not part of the problem in the first place. Agenda 2030 is the document that the uh, United Nations uh, set forth in 2015, to which uh, member states all signed up. It was a follow-up to the 2000 UN meeting where the Millennium Development Goal was laid out. So Agenda 2030 is, in a sense, a compact that the United Nations has set forth with 17 points that the member states are committed in so many different ways to abide by and to invest in for a world in which, as agenda number one states, there will be no hunger. That's the program. In other words, agenda 2030 is a global map for resolving the problems of poverty, of hunger, of sickness, of disease around the world and to bring about uh, a global development. And Canada has committed itself to Agenda 2030. Having committed itself to Agenda 2030, it has now signed the UN Global Compact for Migration. Okay, so what does Agenda 2030 hopes to achieve? Agenda 2030 hopes to bring about development in the global south. Well, is this something new? Or is this something that has been tried repeatedly? And the question is, what is the result that we have at hand by which to assess what the United Nations is setting forth for member states to do? The record of UN-directed developmental program stretches all the way back to the period after the end of Second World War. And that record is not simply mixed. That record has colossal failures in it. The United Nations, during this period, and through its other agencies, such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Funds and various other developmental agencies of the United Nations, such as the UNDP, United Nations Development Program, has doled out somewhere close to three trillion dollars. And the result is, ironically, global migration, mass unfettered migration from global south 
to the global north. People find themselves, for instance, in Africa, parts of Asia, Central and South America, as we are witnessing the movement of people headed towards the United States, that they can not find any promise for themselves and their families going forward into the future. And so they're leaving their country, their native land, and heading as economic migrants to the global north. Now, after having spent $3 trillion, this is the result. Then the question begs itself, why? What has the UN achieved? And can more of the same lead to any improvement of the same? We have the old definition of what is fanaticism. Fanaticism means doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. So the United Nations and its agencies, with the support of Western governments such as Canada, is committed to doing the same thing over and over again, expecting that there will be a different result, that countries like Malawi, Namibia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, what have you, Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, will, over a period of time, let's say the next, as the 2030 agenda says, between now and 2030, will become, in some ways, more prosperous, more developed, have more responsive governments for their citizens. Why should we expect that will happen? Because the result of the past 70 years has been quite the contrary. We have seen, since the end of the Cold War in the 1990s, a rapid increase in failed economies, in states that we now call failed states. We have seen a spike in warfare. We have seen a spike in genocide, the Rwanda genocide, for instance, the famines in Somalia and Ethiopia, we have seen the rise of terrorism. These are, in effect, the cumulative result of the United Nations failure by doling out money to solve the problem that are of historical nature in countries that came about at the end of Second World War. 19th and 20th century was a history of movement from empire to nation. 20th century was the coming of nation states in former colonies of European powers. So the states of Africa became independent as a result of colonial powers divesting themselves of colonies. It began with Britain leaving India, and India was partitioned and became an independent state along with Pakistan. Okay. Ironically now, Agenda 2030 is we are heading from nation states back to empire. The empire in this case is the United Nations. That the global governance is the idea that United Nations has the capacity to pick up the failed states and provide for their transition from where they were, pre-industrial, pre-modern, primarily agricultural-based economies, to modern industrial economies with responsive government, if they can have responsive government, or local authorities that will implement the UN agenda. In a sense, the UN then is engaged in global governance. But the United Nations cannot do that if it doesn't have the resources and backing of powerful, rich countries. And that's where Canada comes in. United States comes in, the European Union comes in, Japan comes in, and so on and so forth. 
And it is then incumbent upon us, according to the UN agenda, that we embrace go global governance and hand up the resources that the United Nations needs and requires to provide for development in the global south to minimize what the United Nations would then expect, this unfettered migration, and failing which, then the migration would be spread out among the countries of the north and the west so that they accommodate the population uh, as per a UN formula. The European Union has come up with an addendum to the UN Global Compact, and that addendum lays out in a formula, state-by-state -state basis of the European Union, the expected capacity in terms of population, the absorptive capacity of each member state to have a population that would be then the optimum size of population for those member states. For example, according to this European Union table, Germany absorptive capacity is around 275 million. The absorptive capacity of Sweden is around 440 million. So for instance, Germany, with a present day population of somewhere around 70 million, according to the European Union, has an absorptive capacity of 275 million. That is four times, almost four times the size of the current population. This is the absorptive capacity to accommodate the global migration. So, with that same sort of example that you have at hand, Canada, with a country with five time zone, a population somewhere around 36 million, would have an absorptive capacity five, six, seven times the present size of the Canadian population. There are people in Canada, for instance, members of the Monk Center in Toronto, attached to the University of Toronto, that have spoken about as quickly as possible for Canada to reach a population figure of 100 million people. That will then make Canada potentially a major power, which is what 36 million people doesn't provide for, and that this population will come as a result of very rapid absorption of people heading towards Canada or invited to come to Canada. So, in this argument of UN Global Compact, the countries of the North have to shift and accommodate the population of the Global South.